uh, cats are allowed on your uh, laps or your desks or your heads, as some of us have it, um, dashins as well, and uh, coffee is mandatory. So let's get into the metaverse future. And what I'm going to present to you is not selling the metaverse to you in any way. Um, it's rather painting a picture of what the metaverse is, what it isn't, what it can do and what it can't do and what it shouldn't really do. So first I'll give you an overview of where it fits into the big new technology trends that are shaping our world, shaping business and shaping the consumer society as well. Number one is artificial intelligence, which goes hand in hand with machine learning. And even though we don't know it, it is shaping our lives every day. When you use Google Maps or Waze or Uber, you're actually using artificial intelligence because it's deeply built in. And machine learning is what keeps improving the mapping and the uh, traffic, rec traffic pattern recognition that you see in these apps. Robotic process automation is the technical term for chatbots. And it's basically automating your conversations or your queries with organizations. All that a chatbot really is, is a, a website that's been given uh, voice um, recognition because you're really asking the chatbot to go looking on a website or in a knowledge base for the information that you're requesting. And then cloud computing, but that's already old hat, but cloud-based business modeling and being able to launch a business in the cloud and operate a business in the cloud, that is a transformative technology. Instant connectivity is coming. <laughs> I know we're in South Africa, but if you have the right connectivity, if you have the right setup, then you do experience instant connectivity, but 5G will make it pervasive. Then comes virtual reality and augmented reality. Combined, they refer to as X reality. So they're fairly far down the picking order of technologies that are changing our world. And then comes blockchain and blockchain incorporates uh, uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, as well as the uh, world of N NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which I won't go into much today. But there are tremendous warnings around embracing all of these technologies, especially artificial intelligence. Stephen, Walking, Stephen Hawking himself, who uh, you would imagine took great advantage of, of rudimentary artificial intelligence, felt that it could spell the end of the human race. And then the very president of the Association for the Advancement of AI said that a fully autonomous system is one that we don't really want because we wouldn't have any control um, over it. So with every new technology, there are warnings. And we've seen that movie before where not only are there warnings about the new technologies, but there are naysayers everywhere. And it goes all the way back to the invention of the telephone. It's a legendary that the Western Union president said that the telephone couldn't be taken seriously. It has no inherent value. The myth is that Alexander Graham Bell tried to sell it to William uh, Orton and to Western Union, but that's not true. Uh, Bell was on honeymoon when his father-in-law showed that he was not a very nice um, father. He tried to sell the patents for the phone to uh, Western Union. And fortunately for Bell, um, Western Union rejected this out of hand. Bell himself saw the value and he saw the future and he had no intention of offloading it to Western Union. And for the next 100 years, the Bell uh, company dominated uh, telephone communications in the United States. South Africa was only 11 years behind. Some of you may remember uh, Adolf Butke, if you live in Cape Town and you've been around a while, uh, he brought the very first telephone into South Africa in 1878. And it took only 18 years. It's a fast moving city, you see. Uh, for the city to get its own exchange. But not surprising when you look at the kind of devices that they were trying to sell people. But as in the world of cell phones, very quickly, they try to sell you the high-end flagship phones 
like the Ericsson AC120. It's actually the coolest phone on the block. You couldn't put it in your pocket though, a little bulky uh, for that. But interestingly, a hundred years later, Ericsson was one of the world leaders in mobile phone innovation. I think it was the P900. Some of you of a certain age may even have used that, which was the first really effective, what they called an office phone, which was the predecessor to the uh, smartphone. And um, Ericsson was able to maintain a legacy for 100 years, but then the rapid pace of innovation in the smartphone will left them behind. Today, they are world leading network infrastructure company, but they don't exist in the world of phone manufacture um, anymore. And you'll see that story replay itself again and again, as the incumbents are swept away by the more innovative, agile newcomers. This was my uh, first telephone that I used in Tromsberg. Um, you can see the number on that phone is 33. That was actually the station's number. Our home number was 142. That's how few phones there were in Tromsberg. Um, our shop had the number seven. So if you phoned um, from the shop to home, um, you may well have the exchange saying, because you had to find the exchange, you had to turn that uh, little a lever and pick up the handset and the exchange would answer normal as a brief and you would ask for let's say your mother and the lady at the exchange would say she's not at home at the moment she's at auntie esther i'll put you through to auntie esther and that was uh, the advent of social media long before social media existed not very different was the first predecessor to netflix that is the very first TV set being demonstrated in 1927. Now you'd think the world would get very excited about the world's first TV, but the New York Times said prior to this uh, demonstration that the Ameri average American family hasn't got time to sit glued to a screen. Uh, well, Netflix is delighted that history proved them very wrong. Um, back in 1927, uh, a year after that prediction, Philo Farnsworth, 21-year-old kid, demonstrated the first TV. The astonishing thing is that he had lived in a house without electricity until he was 14. So people ask how a kid from Promsburg with a dial, with, with a little manual sling telephone could get such an interest in the internet. Well, it's because you're thirsty for something more because you are isolated and don't have access to what your imagination tells you is possible out there. And Philo Fonswood proved that with a vengeance, inventing the tele television uh, set uh, a mere seven years after you first had access to electricity. Again, those of a certain age will recognize this technology. That's the, an early version of fast forward in the days of uh, tape recording. But let's fast forward now to 2016, when uh, the next big innovation was brought to stage. This is the launch of the Samsung S7 in 2016 at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. So I was in the audience where they told us to put on these virtual reality headsets called the Galaxy Gear. And Samsung took us to what you could experience in the Galaxy Gear. And while we were in this virtual world, that man walked past us onto stage and we took off our headsets and there was Mark Zuckerberg telling us why virtual reality would be the next platform for social media. We would go into Facebook and other social networks through a virtual reality platform. Well, having just experienced it in the Galaxy Gear headset, it was patent nonsense. There was no ways that people would prefer to go into a headset to connect with people, to leave messages, to type in um, messages and to post photos and videos in a virtual reality environment versus a plain old browser or a phone app, which is so quick and simple, as opposed to having to, in effect, get dressed in order to go to social media. Who gets dressed to participate in social media? Never mind putting on extra equipment. That's what the Galaxy Gear looked like. And what made it revolutionary for that minute was the fact that you no longer needed to be connected to a computer your cell phone could plug into the headset. 
So you had mobile virtual reality for uh, the first time. Um, the flaw in that picture is that the headset was designed to take only a very specific format of cell phone. And that was the Galaxy S7 and its predecessor, the Galaxy S6. Only those two phones fit into the Galaxy Gear headset. That's why today you can pick up Galaxy Gear headsets for about 400 Rand instead of 4,000 uh, Rand. It's obsolete. And even the operating system that you use on it, which was Facebook's Oculus uh, platform, uh, doesn't really work on the Galaxy Gear anymore. You can get it to work if you're a techie or you, you have an 11-year-old in the home. But generally speaking, they're all gathering dust uh, in a cupboard somewhere. So since 2016, Zuckerberg and Facebook have been trying to own the concept of the metaverse. They just didn't call it the metaverse uh, back then. The whole intention was to try to monetize their new acquisition, which was uh, Oculus, both the operating system for virtual reality and the headsets. At that stage, the Oculus Rift headset was the uh, market leader in terms of technology. Today, it's the Oculus Quest that leads the market with 80% uh, market share. So they are dominant, but in a very small market. At that stage, Zuckerberg saw social media transitioning to virtual reality. Last year, he changed the name of his company from Facebook to Meta. Facebook, the social network, is now a subsidiary of Meta, the virtual reality organization. At least that was his vision. And he argued that people would want to work in uh, the metaverse or in virtual reality as well. Even Microsoft CEO, uh, very shortly after that, uh, presented a, um, a vision of people using Office through virtual reality. Again, patent nonsense. They were trying to sell solutions, and Zuckerberg in particular, trying to uh, restate the value of his organization. But virtual reality wasn't invented in 2016. This is the first commercial virtual reality system called the virtuality system. Built in 1990, at the time it cost $65,000, a cool million rand. Um, some of you may have come across an artist in Johannesburg by the name of Don Sill, who works um, in virtual reality and in 3D art. He has a company called Haptics. And in 1995, he brought two of these machines into South Africa probably at the cost of about a million rand, um, sponsored, and he took it on the tour of the country to try and excite people about virtual reality. And that was my first experience of it. You've got to get into the machine, strap yourself in, in effect, connect that headset to um, the uh, machine that you're standing in, connect that handset to the machine you're standing in. And then with that very heavy weight on your head, you go into a virtual world, as a knight fighting dragons or other knights, or uh, you could explore virtual worlds. There was one fundamental problem with it. Uh, immediately as I switched on or put on the headset, I felt this does not feel real. It was such a pixelated version of reality that it took me quite a while before I could buy into the fact that I was in a virtual environment. And by then, I started getting a headache from the weight of the machine on my head. So it was not an auspicious start to, to my adventures in virtual reality. And this is the fundamental problem even today. And we're talking now 32 years after that machine was built. This, if you look at the pixelated image on the left, is how virtual reality compares to reality if you look at the picture um, on the right. Well, reality is, of course, far more dazzling even than the picture on the right, but that's the comparative um, quality that you're getting in VR versus reality. And if that's what you have to choose between as a working environment, clearly you're going to choose reality. You don't want a blurred environment, but I'll come back to that as a working environment. Virtual reality does have its uses. This is Professor Dr. Albert Rizzo, 
better known to his friends as Skip. And he runs a, a creative technology medical solutions division of the University of Southern California. And he has, over the last five years, been developing virtual reality solutions for therapy. And this was at an event called Dell World in Las Vegas in 2018, where he explained his methodology to Jeffrey Wright, who um, is one of the actors in Westworld. If you've seen Westworld, you'll know. And spoiler alert for those who are still planning to watch it, um, if Netflix is still in your distant future, but uh, he plays both a human and an android. And um, he was the ideal person to interview uh, Skip Rizzo about using virtual reality as a form of therapy. So what you see in the background is images of soldiers in virtual reality headsets, just to symbolize the fact that they were using it to treat veterans coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq uh, for post-traumatic stress disorder. And they've been highly successful in uh, treating those patients. And today it's being used for pain management for cancer patients, for example, undergoing oncology uh, treatment. So wide usage in the world of medicine, especially. And essentially with PTSD, they recreate the scenarios in which the soldiers found themselves and take them through the experience and help them come to terms with the experience. So you can imagine there is tremendous application in the educational world as well, taking children through an environment, as Tracy said earlier, for example, uh, to walking among the dinosaurs as opposed to just looking at pictures of the dinosaurs. In architecture, there's tremendous application to allow people to walk through proposed uh, designs. Uh, my daughter living and working in Los Angeles at the moment, one of her roles in a set construction company is to create virtual reality walkthroughs of proposed sets before uh, they are built. So you can see the immen immense range of applications of uh, virtual reality in uh, the commercial world, in the me medical world, in the educational world. And South Africa has some of the world's leading virtual reality developers in simulation and training for working at heights, for example, and working in high voltage environments. Um, in the days when ESCOM still had power, uh, they had to train people to work in these high voltage environments before they entered them to avoid them um, shocking themselves to death by touching the wrong uh, wires or uh, buttons or whatever the case might be. And they would do that through these kinds of virtual reality simulation environments. Driver training also, especially in big trucks, is now done in virtual reality environments. Pilot training for many years has been done through simulators, but now virtual reality comes into the picture to give added nuance to that training. So tremendous applications, again, in the world of uh, training um, and education. So it's not about the technology as such. It's not getting excited about what you're going to put on your head. It's getting excited about what you can do with it and if you have a use for it. The same applies in the world of drones. So drones are great toys. And in most cases, um, they are bought as toys, as something to have fun with, to shoot very cool videos from the air um, to spy on the neighbors. Oh wait, that's illegal. Okay, don't do that. Um, but in this particular case, it's surveying a forest to assess both the risk of fire, but also to assess the uh, conditions on the ground and in the trees. And a drone can essentially film an orchard a crop field or a forest and using um, artificial intelligence analysis of that uh, video footage can instantly also assess the state of the crop or the ground or the trees and then through that same artificial intelligence system can then guide the um, owners or the operators of the drone in how to respond and how to treat the crops as the case might be. 
there's a company in Cape Town called Aerobotics, which is a world leader in this uh, technology. And they've pulled in um, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of rands in venture capital from both South Africa and um, globally for their technology because they are so ahead of the game. So in some cases, it's referred to as agri-tech, agricultural technology, but um, it's, it's also a cutting edge use of drone technology. But it's about the use case. It's about what you can do with it. It's not about trying to find a use for the technology. So what is the use case for the metaverse? First, let's just go back to where it began. How many of you have read Neuromancer or Snow Crash? And how many of you have been in Second Life? Um, not too many. Neuroman Neuromancer was a novel written in 1984, and it coined the phrase or the term cyberspace. And it was the first novel that imagined people going into an immersive environment through their computers. In the case of Neuromancer, you actually felt you were inside it because the machines were plugged into your head. But cyberspace, this um, inner space that you entered, became the term that described the internet years later. Uh, Neuromancer is probably my all-time favorite uh, novel. And then in 1992, Neil Stevenson wrote Snow Crash, and that introduced the term or the word, the metaverse, which was the first use of the word metaverse. And it described a virtual reality world in which you could buy property, you could uh, go clubbing, um, and you could own various assets. And that metaverse in the novel was owned by a global fiber optic baron, the guy who had the monopoly on fiber optic connectivity around the world. He was also an evil baron, who, or an evil monopolist who wanted to use the metaverse to control people, but mainly to control them in order to control their spending habits. Does that sound familiar? We wonder why Mark Zuckerberg would choose that word with that history to define his organization. Probably because he's pretty tone deaf in general, and he's probably tone deaf to what the metaverse really represented uh, back then. And then the very first real metaverse, the first virtual reality world in which you could explore, build, own land, buy assets, and even have your own currency was called Second Life. But it's already 20 years old. It still exists today. Um, I went exploring back then, and one of my most fascinating experiences was finding that Latvia had created a consulate in Second Life, and there are two people staffing that consulate and i conducted an interview with them to understand that what are the benefits of running a consulate in a virtual world and essentially what it boiled down to is that they were keen to attract young people who wanted to uh, go and work in a country that was visionary with regard to technology so that was pretty visionary so it was a positioning exercise more than anything else but you could actually get application forms and the like through their consulate in uh, the metaverse or in uh, Second Life. This is a scene from Second Life. This is someone who had far too much time on his hands who built this particular um, environment. Second Life created the uh, basics for it, but the buildings, you would uh, essentially stake your claim to a piece of land and then start building using tools available in Second Life. It had some incredible environments like this one, for example, floating islands. Probably very difficult to build this particular environment, but you could. You could go into Second Life, but if you didn't want to build, you could explore as well, and you could meet people also. <clears throat> so one of the things Second Life um, was very useful for was so socializing, and people would arrange to meet in a particular place like let's go meet on the floating island and you would chat in the floating island. But it never took off in a massive way because people still prefer seeing each other over a table in the restaurant, just for example. This is um, today's answer to Second Life. 
It's called Decentraland. This is the entrance area of Decentraland, and it's the world's leading virtual reality environment. The beauty of this is, and of Second Life, is you don't need a virtual reality headset. You can access this through a browser. And this is, in fact, a screenshot from a browser uh, window. So uh, virtual worlds, generally speaking, are browser-based worlds. They're not virtual reality-based worlds. But they are tailor-made for virtual reality, for exploring. So once you're in Decentraland, you create an avatar, which is a digital representation of yourself. And that's how lame the avatars can get. Um, but you can get far more elaborate. And you can start spending money to dress up your avatar, to make yourself look cool, and to make yourself more and more uh, realistic as time goes on. The virtual worlds of the future will be far more photorealistic. Right now, they're very blocky, very graphic, as opposed to photorealistic. <coughs> um, South Africa or Africa has its own virtual world called Ubuntu Land. And it, it looks very similar to the others, except with an African theme. But I just wanted to show you that it has a very specific African orientation as well. It's created by a company called Africa Rare, which is South Africa's leading developer of virtual reality environments. <coughs> and then this year, the global ad agency Wunderman Thompson uh, released a report in which they tried to define the metaverse because of the intensifying interest from the business world in the metaverse. They called it into the metaverse. The scene there, excuse me a second. The scene there is from Decentraland, which hosted the uh, 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 metaverse fashion awards last year and that's become an annual event fashion is huge in the metaverse not just virtual fashion but also selling fashion through stores that are set up in decentraland decentraland is the most expensive place to buy real estate in uh, virtual worlds ubuntu land isn't cheap either but a lot cheaper than decentraland and then Wunderman thompson ran a survey that they reported in this um, uh, study where they looked at which industries will be most impacted by the metaverse, but based on a survey of people who knew what the metaverse was. So they're talking to the converted in a way. 90% said it would be for entertainment, 89% advertising, which stands to reason. But then 86% said retail, which still you could get away with because there are a lot of shops selling product in uh, the metaverse. But then the very next one, just behind retail, almost the same level, 85% employment and work, right alongside fashion, 85%. Fashion, you can understand, but employment and work, this tells you that those who have bought into the metaverse have bought into it hook, line, and sinker. They don't consider the limitations of it all they are looking at is the possibilities and possibilities always go with limitations <coughs> the biggest concerns about the metaverse privacy and data security privacy number one children's privacy slightly ahead of general privacy but you can see uh, more than two thirds of respondents are highly concerned about privacy. And then when it comes to children's safety, a high proportion see that as a major issue. And bullying is regarded as a major threat in the metaverse. But then look at this, what people expect the metaverse to do in their daily lives. And this is quite stunning that 70% um, of people believe that it's going to be a place to shop regularly. 68% see it as the future of e-commerce. 82% a place to socialize. However, only half of respondents see it as a part of their daily life or a place to work. And again, bear in mind, these are people who know what the metaverse is. Only half of them see it as a place to work. But that half hasn't worked in the metaverse, and that is the key. 
once you work in the metaverse, your experience is very, very different. Microsoft funded a project that was run by various universities around the world. They got 18 people to volunteer to work in the metaverse for a whole week. And as this headline says, two lasted just hours. And to a person that hated the experience. Why? Many experience nausea, anxiety, migraines. They reported on average a 42% increase in frustration levels, 48% increase in eye strain, 20% drop in well being. Imagine if you were offered a job where they said you're going to get very frustrated and you're going to have a 48% increase in eye strain and your well being will drop out 20%. Come work for us. Of course not. Most uh, tellingly, however, participants felt less productive. And uh, one of the great example, examples was they couldn't take physical notes in the virtual reality environment. That is the limitation of the current technology, however. So as the technology improves, some of these issues could be addressed. But eye strain, major issue, and a drop in well-being, that is going to be the deal breaker. That will keep people out of the metaverse unless there is a use case for it. In South Africa, we released research just a couple of months ago on social media use in South Africa. And amongst other, we asked people if they had explored a virtual world. And bear in mind, the virtual world can be something like people who use Fortnite, who attend events in Fortnite. So Fortnite is a game that is one of the most popular in the world, very popular in South Africa. And Fortnite is now becoming a venue for live events like music concerts in a virtual world. So 16% might sound like, wow, that's a lot of people using the metaverse, but it's actually very small when you consider the potential usage of these kind of virtual worlds. And it's the exact same proportion of people who use Tinder in South Africa. For those of a certain age, Tinder is an online dating app. Um, but it is regarded as mainstream whereas the metaverse isn't regarded as mainstream. So what you're really seeing there is that Tinder has reached a plateau of usage in this country and is regarded as a standard tool for people uh, of certain requirements, whereas the metaverse is just starting and that is the beginning of a rising trajectory um, before it becomes regarded as mainstream. Interestingly, we looked at an analysis of uh, discussion of the metaverse on Twitter in South Africa, and we constructed a word cloud around uh, the metaverse. So firstly, most of the discussions of the metaverse included terms like NFT, non-fungible tokens that we mentioned earlier. Again, I'm not going into NFTs at this stage unless there are questions. Crypto, NFTs are built on crypto, and uh, Web3, which is a ca catch-all term for the metaverse, crypto, NFTs, et cetera. So from a, a technology point of view, the metaverse goes hand in hand with all of those. However, in terms of what people were discussing in uh, the metaverse and the um, context in which they were discussing it, the word that was most commonly associated with the metaverse was friends. So people saw it as a socialization environment and uh, not as a business kind of environment. So it's about social and it's about entertainment. And anyone who wants to do business in the metaverse or wants to use it as a business platform will have a lot of convincing to do in the early days. So that's another drawback to using it as a business. And then Meta's own bet on the metaverse is uh, fading a little. At the time, they changed the name to Meta. They also announced a $10 billion investment in Reality Labs, the virtual reality uh, division. And uh, when they released their results a few weeks ago, they revealed that they were losing a billion dollars a month on their Metaverse uh, project. And their revenues were down and the share price dropped for the first time um, in um, or, or rather their revenue dropped for the first time, I think, since they were listed. 
And then almost in the same breath, I think it was the day before, this was the announcement. They were increasing the price of the Quest 2 virtual reality headset. Um, it's a strange thing because in effect, demand was dropping, so they increased the price so that they could um, restore their revenues by making up for the lost sales. Now that, of course, will ensure that fewer units are sold. It also ensures that um, it will take longer for it to become a mainstream tool. And the significance of that for South Africa and the African continent is that $100 translates into almost 2,000 uh, rand that you're adding as an additional barrier to entry to uh, the metaverse, certainly to virtual reality. So it keeps virtual reality further away from becoming mainstream across the African continent. Um, the metaverse, as in virtual environments, not virtual reality, like Second Life and Decentraland and Ubuntu Land, that doesn't depend on virtual reality headsets. So the metaverse as a browser-based environment, yes. The metaverse through virtual reality, no, in this country. But again, it's not about the technology, it's about the use case. Where you have a use case, it will be very powerful. There's a project at Baraguan Hospital at the moment in Soweto, looking at the possible use of virtual reality for um, uh, pain, management and uh, therapy. Uh, if that comes off, it will be a, a world leading uh, use case and test case for uh, virtual reality. But it has to be about that use case. It's not about using the technology for its own sake. So no, you don't have to go to work in the metaverse. You don't have to go to work through virtual reality headsets. And it's unlikely that it'll become a common requirement in our lifetimes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Arthur. Wow, so interesting. <laughs> um, I was wondering, sorry, can we ask questions? Are you, are you, you, you finished the presentation? Yes, I'm open to questions. I'm just wondering, I saw the research that you've done and you've covered everything in the research that was done with those that uses the virtual reality. And I was just wondering about education, training, what was, I, mean, I don't know if you've seen what were their thoughts, uh, because, you know, um, especially in country like South Africa, where we are lacking resources in schools. Um, you know, is setting up labs for science and, you know, physics and chemistry and things like that. Is there a place for that? I don't know. I mean, I'm just wondering. There's, there's certainly a place for it in terms of um, specific uses. So, for example, if you have a class, um, and let's, let's look at tertiary level first. If you have a class on anatomy, being able to walk people through the heart, and that's one of the um, early use cases that Microsoft demonstrates. Microsoft has an augmented reality headset called the HoloLens, HoloLens, where you can still see your environment around you, but then you can see things overlaid uh, on it. And they showed how a model of the heart could be uh, viewed in the middle of a room and you could walk around the heart to see how it's constructed. So that's a great example uh, because it applies in, in school as well. If, um, if any of you did biology in high school, you may remember how awful it was. Um, every aspect of it, to me anyway, was, was horrible. But if we had virtual reality models that we could use uh, to explore the structure of a leaf or not to have to dissect a frog and all that kind of thing, it would have been a totally different experience. However, the cost of the headsets for those purposes is prohibited. And um, it's hard to see a justification in our education environment to bring that kind of technology into the classroom when there are so many greater needs. Agreed, thank you, thanks. Any other questions from the audience? I mean, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm just wondering, Arthur, from the side of career, 
and metaverse? Is there anything that you could see, something that is emerging that we need to take into consideration from a career choice? Well, if you look at what the virtual reality companies are doing in South Africa, I think it's a fantastic career choice because there are numerous use cases. Again, it always comes to the use case, but there are so many use cases that can be explored and demonstrated. So Sea Monster is a great example, also based in Cape Town, um, of a company uh, doing groundbreaking work in virtual reality, not just in training and simulation, but also in gaming um, and in creating virtual reality experiences and uh, also what they call gamification, which is giving um, people uh, rewards for achieving certain levels of activity, whether it's in uh, training or whether it's um, a shopping loyalty program. So the applications are um, immense. And it's a case of spotting the opportunity. Right now, it's a, it's a little like startups in Silicon Valley in uh, the early um, 2000s, or, or rather, let's say in the early 2010s, after smartphones became mainstream and the apps world exploded, um, anyone with an idea, a good idea for an app and the ability to bring it uh, to market really could almost write their own meal tickets. Uh, venture capital was just looking for, um, for more and more of these innovative ideas and innovative teams to throw their money at, it did mean that you needed a decent team on board. So someone innovating in, in their bedroom or in a garage by themselves, less likely to, to succeed than someone who puts together a team that um, works uh, on a specific problem. But having said that, the um, opportunities in, in the metaverse are massive for innovation because so few people are doing anything in that environment. So, it's, so compare it to the early days of apps. The, the first app store, uh, Apple's app store opened in 2008. The Android um, Play Store uh, was just a couple of years after that. So the whole apps environment is only about 12 to 14 years old. And in the early days, there was tremendous opportunity. And that's what we're seeing now with virtual reality and the metaverse. There's massive opportunity there, but you've got to spot that opportunity. You've got to see what the need is or what the opportunity is. I've got a, an argument um, about innovation and startups in South Africa versus Silicon Valley. And that is that in Silicon Valley, it's all about opportunity. In South Africa and across Africa, it's all about need. So look for the needs, find those needs, answer those needs um, with a sharp idea, and that's your starting point. So I do think that it is a career opportunity. It's just not a working environment. Yes, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting, Arthur. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Arthur? I see we have Joan Joffe on board. Joan, you yes. must have many questions. Joan practically invented the computer industry in South Africa. So before we wrap up this morning's session, I see a lot of people online whose names I'm not familiar with. I'd like to put up a donation poll 